time for this morning. Okay, that's we'll just have lunch time. Yeah, that's uh, no, yeah, I'm not. 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 Yes, it's very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Okay, I'm done. We're going to start. Can we please sit down? We're going to start. I don't need to be rushing around around because he's still just this question. خوش آمد میگم بالاخره با پوزش فراوان برای مصابت تکنیکی که داریم که هنوز حل نشده با این ساعت تحقیق بدیم شده میکنیم که برخلاف همه تجربه خودمون هستش چون این پنا به انگلیسیه من به انگلیسیه دارم میدم Thank you everyone for being with us I apologize for the late start um, before we begin, I'm Roya Kashafi from Association of Iranian Researchers, welcoming you to the 52nd Conference, Baluchistan, Dignity, Justice and Freedom for All, here on 9th of December in London, a very cold, rainy London. Um, I would like to thank Azadi Network, who's uh, collaborated with us and they've provided the catering today and uh, helping us with the technical setup. I'm also very grateful to Balichus Sun Human Rights Group, who've also collaborated with us on this, uh, particularly to Sabah Bandri, who's been instrumental in coordinating everyone, and our dear friend Munir Shirani, who's not here with us. Wish you well, and hopefully you will feel better very soon. Um, we have uh, quite a, an extensive panel, so I'm going to wrap up and ask Dr. Hossein Lajaradi, who's the president of ACI, to come and welcome you. He will speak in Farsi, and then we'll start our panel, which will be in English. Thank you. سلام و دارم به همه شما دوستانی که حضور دارید و همهایی که از طریق آنلاین ما رو دنبال میکنند سپاس گذارم که به این کنفرانس آمدید امروز روز 18 آزر برابر با نوه دسام من اعلام میکنم روز بلوشستان پروفسور ایام اخوان که اینجا تشترند گفتن که امروز روز جنوساید هم از هر جهانی هست فردا هم روز اوغ بشر روز جهانی اوغ بشر به این معنا هر سه موردش معنیدار میشه روز بروشستان، روز جنوساید و روز جهانی اوغ بشر سآلی رو مطرح کردم برای صحبت اولی به این ترتیب که بیشتر روی سخنم با کسانی است که کمتر میخوان که خودشون رو در رابطه با مسائل ایران آشنا بکنن سوال کردم که آیا میدونیم بلوچستان کجاست آیا میدونیم بلوچ کیه البته من باید امیدوار به این باشم که همه ما میدونیم همه ما با درها و رنجها آشنا هستیم تفاوت نمیکنه در چابهار باشیم در شیراز باشیم در گرمی آذربایجان باشیم یا در زابل و در بشاگر ولی امیدوار به این هستم که در هر کجا که هستیم 
بتونیم با هم نوعان خودمون با خوشی ها و شادی ها و درد هاشون آشنا باشیم چرا این کنفرانس به وجود آمده سیزده سال پیش در همین شهر لندن اولین کنفرانس بلوچستان انجام شده از طرف انجامان پجوهشگران ایران امروز این دومین کنفرانسه به دلیل مسائل بسیار بسیار حادی که توی جامعه ما پیش آمده و خاصه در یک سال اخیر در بلوچستان شاید که هیچ کدوم ما اطلاعی از آمارهای دقیق نداشته باشید دلیلش خیلی روشنه در جمهوری اسلامی آمار هیچ معنی نداره آمار سیاسی است هر چه بخوان انتشار میدن و بسیاری از چیزها هم در از اصلا انتشار نمیدن کمانی که به عنوان مثال از پنج سال پیش به این طرف ما دیگه از طرف حکومت آمار زندانیان رو نداریم اصلا وجود خارجی نداریم در حال ارز کردم این دوم کنفرانس هدفمون بیشتر ترکید رو مسائلی که در بلوشستان وجود داره این استان پهناور که دومین استان پهناور ایرانه بعد از کرمان در داخل خودش مسائل و مشکلاتی هم داره که اون هم دستیسه های جمهوری اسلامی است بیشتر البته مسائل قوم قلیدهی هم هست مسائل سیستان و بلوشستان هم هست مسائل زابوز و لاهدان هم هست همین اینها وجود داره ولی در پس یک نکته رو باید بهش توجه داشت و اون اینه که جمهوری اسلامی با تفرقه زنده است با تفرقه انداختن در میون مردم که نتونن با هم دیگه زندگی رو کنن بحث شیع و سنی بحث نمیدونم مسائل مختلفی که وجود داره استان دیفتان و بروشستان و مردمانی که در اونجا زندگی میکنن در یک حکومت آزاد و برابر میتونن که نه تنها یکی از بزرگترین ثروتمندترین استان های ایران باشن بلکه به همجوار های خودشون هم کمک بکنن استانی است که از در اقلیمی دارای کوه‌ها، جنگل‌ها، باطلاق‌ها، از در معادن، معادن گسترده، از در استراتژیک راهیابی به دریای آزاد و دریاهای بنوردی. ولی وقتی که نگاه می‌کنید این استان و مردمش گرفتار فرم هستند در تختی گرسنگی بیماری اعتیاد و بسیاری از مسائل اینچنینی و خشونت و سرکوب گسترده ای که جمهوری اسلامی در اونجا به وجود برده صحبت خودم رو تموم میکنم به این معنا که باور خودم رو مطرح میکنم باور من اینه که ما ایرانی ها چه بلوش باشیم، چه کرد باشیم، چه شیرازی باشیم، چه لور باشیم، چه تبریزی باشیم هیچ تفاوت نمی کنیم. اگر به دنبال این هستیم که مردممون با هم زندگی بکنن و این کشورمون باقی بمونه و تجزیه نشه و از بین نره یک راه بیشتر وجود نداره اون از در من برابری بالاتر از آزادی است چون ما اگر برابر باشیم به آزادی میرسیم الزامن در آزادی به برابری ممکنه نرسیم برابری یعنی چی؟ برابری یعنی این که من یک حق حقوقی دارم در هر کجای این مملکت که هستم بر اساس آمارهایی که چند سال پیش در زمان همین مسئله کووید مطرح شد 
نیم بیشتری از شهر و 26 شهر دبیرستان بیمارستان نداره در حالتی که در کنار دفتر آقای خاطر خامده ای بیمارستان خصوصی وجود داره دست من بحث برابری است دست برابری بحث حقوق بشره بحث حقوق بشر اگر چه ما یک مقداری نتونستیم اون چیزی رو که میخوایم ازش به وجود بیاریم ولی واقعیت های این کار ناپذیر داره راهی جز این نداریم برای ادامه زندگی برای اینکه بتونیم در یک جامعه آزاد یک روزی زندگی بکنیم در اولین مرحله بدونیم جز سرنگونی نظام جمهوری اسلامی جز تمامیت کلیت و موجودیتش هیچ راهی وجود نداره این رو بهش بپردازیم امید این رو داشته باشیم که فردای ایران گامهای اول برداشته بشه برای برابری آزادی و رسیدن به دموکراسی سپاس بدارم Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask my panelists to join me, please. Dr. Rahmani, Saba, please. Miss Saba Bandui, if I don't know if we can pull a bit. Saba Jam, can you come and join me? And Fariba can join me. Um, I'll ask you to join us a bit later. Just we go through the first session. We don't have enough room. Sorry. Bring your name, name. Uh, this panel also will benefit from uh, a Zoom uh, contribution from Vijana Kian, who's joining us at an unearthly hour of two o'clock in the morning from Los Angeles, and also uh, Professor Javid Rahman and Professor Payam Akhavan, who have not sat at the panel because we just don't have enough room at the panel. Um, Dr. Rahmani is a, a lecturer and program leader for human rights and equity studies um, from York University. He's traveled a long way from Canada via Airville in Kurdistan to be with us today. We're very grateful to have him. He's going to talk to us um, to put everything in context. He will talk to us about comparative um, a, a comparative look between international standards, human rights um, uh, values, and what is happening in Iran, what a responsible government should be doing, and what is actually in practice today in Balochistan. Yes. And he will join us also in the Persian panel, in the Persian language panel in the afternoon to introduce the same topic in Farsi, um, because it's such an important thing to understand the bigger framework of um, international law and then how it applies to Iran and specifically to Balochistan. Thank you, Dr. Wherever you're comfortable. Easier probably then. Our thank you very much. Thank you. درود و در بعد شما روز و شبه تحییه بکم روز باش سلام عزیزان خوشحال هستم در خدمت نمستم برنامه رو قرار با انگلیسی صحبت شروع کنیم من نمی از پرد نور رحمانی اسوشیت پروفیسر ات یوک انیبرسیتی پروگرام دایرکتر اف هیومن رایس ان اپیتی ستادیز I thought uh, I would be talking about the principles and um, uh, criteria, fundamental rights which has been established in the United Nations since 1948, uh, started by Eleanor Roosevelt uh, with the universal, the famous Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, uh, which is foundational, uh, unifying, universalized, uh, principles of human dignity, bringing us together in one home called uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, 
over uh, 75 years, tomorrow it will be exactly 75 years, this uh, is anniversary of this fabulous set of uh, laws, uh, 30 articles, which is foundational to every aspect of human being and dignity. Uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights has been translated over 500 languages, uh, has been uh, widely discussed universally about the uh, uh, needs and requirements of all layers of the society and community. Uh, along with two international covenants, which is International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, uh, and International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, is famously uh, set as or called as International Bill of Human Rights. All these three uh, foundational rights bringing us under the perspective uh, which we call open uh, establishment of human dignity. All, uh, for example, if we, if we go detail in the, all the articles of uh, ICCPR or International uh, Covenant of uh, uh, Civil and Political Rights. Uh, the, one of the foundational rights is uh, being free from all layers of discrimination, all forms of discrimination and abuse, right to equality between men and women, right to life, uh, being free from torture, uh, freedom from slavery, liberty, security of persons. So these rights, all the way to the minority rights, ethnic and national rights, uh, the right to self-determination of the people and minorities around the world, right of equality between uh, the diverse uh, races and uh, minorities and religions and cultures, right to work. Um, along with many other uh, international human rights treaties, this set of laws uh, has been established a forms and a structure for people to recognize their rights and respect each other's uh, existence and uh, requirements. The Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Crime uh, of Genocide, which has established also 1948 International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of uh, Racial Discrimination, uh, uh, Convention on the Elimination of Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, this was uh, ratified in 1979, exactly a few, few months right after the uh, Iranian Revolution. And right uh, after that, the uh, Iranian government has been part of these treaties. Uh, the, 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 the Iranian uh, regime, even prior to 1979 revolution, has uh, tremendously participated in all uh, Universal Declaration of Rights and all the Bill of Rights, which has been uh, ratified by the United Nations. Uh, Convention of the, on the Rights of Children, CRC. Uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Uh, since 1948, at least 16 times, Universal Declaration of Human Rights has been um, uh, equipped with uh, a more practical set of laws uh, and uh, being uh, implemented, uh, uh, put in, in um, public uh, process is a question if the state has been sponsoring and uh, recognizing these laws is another thing. Um, you can see that since 1967, Iran has been part of these agreements and treaties. Uh, many of them came about to practice even years after the revolution. Even uh, 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 unfortunately, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran has been sitting as a chair of women while the, the most fundamental abuses towards their women rights has been practiced in Iran post-revolutionary. Um, I, I would like to... Uh, how long I have time? Five. Five more minutes? Okay, so I will be quick. Um, 
there are three things I have categorized as a problems of setting and practicing this set of laws within the uh, real politic and social and cultural life of Iranians. First of all, even prior or after the revolution, this majority of set of laws has been unfortunately in a format of paradoxical uh, way of life uh, when you are interpreting it in the people's life. Um, hybridity is very important because always that the politic and uh, the, the set of laws, civil rights, civil, civil laws, uh, family uh, laws, constitutional uh, set of laws has been directed uh, towards on the paper, towards the liberalization of the society was while in practice, uh, in practice and um, in reality, uh, this uh, set of laws tending towards kind of a, a, a dictatorial authoritarian system of ruling. Uh, for example, the lawmaker, uh, based on uh, post-revolutionary uh, constitution, is God. The, the sovereignty of God has been implemented in the uh, establishing the laws, while uh, in the constitution, in many uh, principles of the Iranian Islamic constitution, is talking about the freedom, democracy, liberalization, uh, liberalization of the uh, institutions, participation, public uh, opinion, uh, and um, ultimate uh, public intervention in the uh, establishment of laws. So this is a kind of a paradoxical that this, the, the laws is saying something what while practicing the pra practical elements of the laws tending towards uh, the uh, Sharia. Uh, Sharia law uh, has been also an issue of uh, conflict within the international law. 1991, the Islamic uh, uh, countries, they were trying to have an answer and respond to was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They, they come up with the uh, Islamic Universal Declaration of Human Rights or Cairo Declaration of Human Rights in 1991 when the, when the foreign ministers of uh, both countries and other Islamic countries, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, and many countries, Egypt, they are trying to have a response towards the uh, human rights. Uh, but in reality, they were conflictual themselves because what kind of a Sharia law we are talking about? Are we talking about the uh, Salafi Saudi uh, set of laws or uh, Shiite Islam Sharia 12 Imamis based on Walayat al Faqih, which even within Iran is uh, disagreement? So uh, these conflictual exist even within all articles. There is not much time to discuss all those uh, constitutional uh, elements of the laws in Iran. But uh, this paradoxes continues all the way to, to the, today. Uh, where the, even the, the, the laws within the constitution, they are based on the vague uh, and very wide and broad uh, definition of the laws. When, when you are setting a, um, a public rights for, or civil rights of a person or a family or a group, then uh, you end up the, the, the paragraph or the set of law with a um, for example, uh, the, the, a vague interpretation of the concept, which again giving the judge and the court and the uh, rulers uh, to uh, decide whatever they want based on their ideological, mental, or religious uh, ideas. For example, some of the laws ends with except in cases of sanction by law or exception will be specified by law or except as uh, provided by law, except in cases provided by law. So this exceptional uh, am amendment towards the laws, it makes it more confused uh, uh, and um, critical. Supreme Leader has the, 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 the full authority uh, based on God's sovereignty on earth. So all this prevents uh, actually the establishment uh, fundamental basic rights, yeah. Uh, I call this uh, abuse and violence of the laws uh, 
implemented within the society, creating a layers of discrimination. Uh, the layers of discrimination because we have a national wide unified discrimination and abuse by the set of laws towards the entire population while uh, using the cross-sectional uh, lens which 1986 um, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw for the first time is talking about layers of discrimination in the uh, sections of the society. When we are talking about Iranian women, we see a kind of a um, discrimination. But deeper we go into Baluchis or Kurds, or even layers of Baluchis in, in more uh, deprived and uh, marginalized regions in Baluchistan, you will see further and deeper abuse and violence and um, the discrimination in the things uh, in the set of laws. So uh, I, I would like to leave the uh, rest of the discussions for the post panel. So quickly, I will tell you that the, the minorities, the Kurds, the Baluchis, they have been most suffering from the uh, uh, this set of laws. Discrimination of use is not only structural, is also based on uh, legal system and cultural and social structure. This has started even prior to revolution, marginalization, abuse, and violence towards this uh, uh, population. Uh, the, uh, the assimilation, uh, forced migration, uh, forced um, uh, the employment or um, lack of access to resources are set by those kind of uh, structural violence. The, the execution of the Kurds and Baluchis almost uh, has been over 75% of the entire uh, population. And this proportional, that such, this proportional um, share of the uh, violence and abuse toward this minority uh, apart from the all uh, lack of access to resources has created huge marginalization uh, gap, which I call it uh, paradoxes in the Middle East. Unfortunately, um, uh, the paradoxical way of life has established through the culture, education, set of laws, and implementation of the laws. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that we have to rush our speakers. Um, we all um, a lot of the information that Dr. Rahmani has will be published in the book of the conference, so um, we will benefit from your vast knowledge there. Um, the Islamic Republic has ratified some of these um, conventions since the revolution, but most of them are conditional, like in the uh, case of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Um, and as it is, we still don't have a clear definition of who is a minor in Iran because of this ambiguity in the law and the fact that although the convention says minor is under 18 in Iran, that is not the case. And um, like it's the same case with a lot of other um, conventions that it has signed since. I'm grateful. So I will quickly move on to our next speaker, who is our beautiful <laughs> UN representative of Baluchistan Human Rights Group, who will be talking for us, uh, Sabah Bandui, um, will be talking about uh, Baluchistan specifically during the last 44 years. Are you comfortable here or would you rather go? Uh, okay. You're right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests. Um, today we are gathered to discuss a matter of utmost importance, a matter that inter intertwines the fabric of civil liberties, uh, political landscapes and intrinsic rights of individuals. Our focus rests upon Baluchistan, a region where the intersection of religion, language, national identity, persecution and human rights present a complex, complex tableau demanding our attention. Human rights, the bedrock of any civilized society, are being trampled upon in Baluchistan. The principles of equality, dignity, and freedom are being disregarded, causing immeasurable suffering and justice. In the heart of the Women Life Freedom Movement lies Baluchistan, a region characterized by its rich cultural heritage, diverse population, and historical significance. It is important to include 
But here, that Baluchistan has a young population with the majority being under the age of 40 years old. This young population has hopes, they have dreams, they aspire to do well in society. No child is born aspiring to get into illegal work in order to make ends meet. However, beneath this tapestry of cultural splendor lies a troubling reality, one marred by systematic challenges threatening the very essence of human rights and civil liberties. In Baluchistan, the prevailing regime has ado adopted a to totalitarian regime, subscribing to the belief of a singular religion, language, and culture. This rigid stance advocates for uniformity, as well as obedience, enforcing a narrative that endorses one religion, one language, one culture, and uh, as the sole accepted norm. Consequently, consequently, the regime's policies aim to suppress the diverse religious practices, linguistic expressions, and cultural identities that exist within Baluchistan. This totalitarian ideology acts as a tool for systematic oppression of the Sunni majority population, exasperating the existence, uh, existing tensions and violating the very essence of religious freedom, linguistic diversity and cultural heritage. According to recent UN uh, Iran Human Rights Min uh, Monitor, Baluchistan has been identified as the poorest uh, region within Iran depicting a stark reality where approximately 75% of its population grapples with living below the poverty line. Even more distressing is the fact that 45% of Baluchistan in, Baluchistan's inhabitants live below the absolute poverty line. Paradoxically, this impoverished region stands as one of the wealthiest in terms of natural resources, like natural gases and valuable minerals such as gold. However, with a, a approximately uh, moreover, sorry, with approximately 750 kilometers of coastline, Baluchistan serves as a, cru a crucial gateway to the Indian Ocean, playing a vital role in the country's import and export dynamics. However, despite the abundance of these, abundance of these valuable resources and its strategic geographical location, the Baluch people are systematically denied access to the benefits of these industries. Instead, mining and fishing rights have been granted to external entities like China, raising concerns about the exploitation and misuse of these vital resources. Fishing, which has traditionally been a means of survival for numerous families, is now under threat, and many finding it increasingly difficult to provide even the basic necessities for their households. The situation underscores a glaring instant that injustice where the local population is excluded from the economic gains derived from its own uh, land and seas. The wealth that should be a source of prosperity for the Baluch people has been uh, appropriated by external entities, exasperating the economic uh, hardship faced by the already marginalized population. This exploitation of resources, coupled with a denial of opportunities for local popu population, perpetrates a cycle of poverty and stifles the pot uh, potential for say, sustainable growth and development within Baluchistan. In a few instances, uh, in the, the few instances where school is, is accessible in Baluchistan, the grim reality unveils an education system that is rudimentary at best and prevalent at worst. Many village schools operate under makeshift te tents, operating, uh, offering minimal protection from harsh winters and exposing fire hazards, uh, posing fire hazards during the scorching summers. These conditions jeopardize the safety and comfort of students, impacting their ability to focus on learning. Compounding uh, these challenges, the education infrastructure is severely lacking, often relying on single teachers to cater to a widespread spectrum of ages and academic levels. Adding to this predicament, children without national identification papers are officially barred from attending school, and the majority being girls, However, in the display of remarkable courage, some teachers risk punishment by allowing these marginalized children to sit in the back of the classroom, silently observing in the hope of learning even the most rudimentary skills like reading and writing. This clandestine act of defiance against systematic discrimination highlights the sheer determination of educators to provide a glimpse of education to those deprived of even the most basic, learning, uh, basic rights to learning. In Baluchistan, a staggering number uh, uh, amounting to hundreds of thousands face the dire reality of lacking national identification documents, a circumstance that in, in 
uh, in, in dangers uh, that brings about a web of oppression spanning from birth to death. Deprived of these official documents, individuals are systematically excluded from vital aspects of societal uh, participa uh, participation. These absence of, uh, the absence of these identif identification papers erects in uh, surmountable barriers, denying access to formal education, prohibiting the pursuit of gain, gaining uh, employment, impeding the opening of bank accounts, and even uh, precluding uh, legal representation in uh, court trials. This uh, multifaceted oppre uh, oppression casts a long shadow over every aspect of their lives, where the absence of national identification uh, documents extends even to death. Denying the basic right to a death certificate at times, refusing a formal burial, these individuals encounter a, a cycle of marginalization um, that, uh, 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 sorry, the marginalization Ooh, I've lost it. <laughs> um, denying their their basic their existence and uh, the fact that they are even exist within society. When a child is born into a society which makes even getting formula milk, according to a recent uh, report to in, to Rassang News, uh, becomes challenging without identification papers or where it frowns upon to speak in mother tongue. When uh, that. What tends to happen in it is the child grows up to believe that they are inferior compared to the desirable other. A Baluch girl face, faces double discrimination. On one hand, a Baluch uh, ethnic minority, and then on the other hand, a female in a patriarchal society where male dominance is more prevalent compared to Western societies. There is a condition in psychology called learned helplessness. This condition manifests with an individual consistence individual consistently receiving the impression of inadequacy and absence of prospects, particularly in a child in childhood, leading to a state of uh, re resignation, uh, where any participation from a promising future is uh, relinquished. The restriction of Baluch individuals from from pivotal societal roles not only impedes their cultural expression, self-determination, and the form of societal attune to their needs, but also obstructs the fulfillment of their human rights. Denial of opportunities to participate in governments uh, deprives governance, deprives for, uh, them from platform on advocates for policies that safeguard their cultural heritage, show social economic advancements, and overall well-being. Empowering Baluchi individuals to contribute meaningfully to decision-making process not only respects their right of self-determination, but also upholds their fundamental, upholds their fundamental human rights, fostering a society that respects, protects, and fulfills the uh, aspirations and rights of all its members. Persecution in various forms casts a, a long shadow over the lives of those in Baluchistan. It manifests in arbitrary arrests and forced disappearances, stifling, uh, stiffening uh, uh, of dissenting voices, a grim reality that undermines the very essence of justice and equity. In, in the specific case of Baluchistan, where systematic human rights abuses and persecutions prevail, the invocation uh, of universal ju ju juris jurisdiction um, becomes an imp uh, imper imperative instrument of addressing the injustices faced by the Baluch people. The intentional oppression orchestrated by the central government to suppress the Baluch people and exploit them from governmental interests become evident. Even the challenges within the local uh, uh, legal framework and the impediments in uh, assessing justice domestically, the application of universal ju juris jurisdiction offers a crucial lifeline. It enables legal action to be taken in foreign jurisdictions against those responsible for perpetrating human rights violations in Baluchistan, transcending the limitations and barriers present within the region. The global legal mechanism empowers the international community to stand in solidarity with Baluchistan advocating for accountability and justice beyond the confines of national boundaries. It, prevent, it presents an opportunity to bring perpetrators to trial in courts where impunity is not tolerated, providing a, a glimmer of hope for those seeking redress and uh, cognition in their fundamental rights within the international legal arena. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for that very thought-provoking um, presentation. Um, you touched on a very important point, which was this learned helplessness. Um, and it's very important to assess when we look to the future and how we can bring about change is how we can change that attitude. And I'm amazed that this is our 52nd conference and we've often struggled to have female experts participate in our um, conferences. It was amazing and a privilege for us to have so many amazing Baluchi women who have contributed to this conference. And as you will see in the next panel also, they have participated. The civil society um, outside Iran is active. It's linked to their communities back in Iran. And it's, and it's given me hope for the future. What we hear is all doom and gloom because that is the reality of everyday life in Iran today. But there is so much hope and scope for change when we see the vibrant community and how determined they are to bring about change and affect um, a better life for the people um, who are there living under such strong persecution, intentional um, persecution. One of the people who became the voice of women life freedom for suffering of the Iranian Baluch people was Fariba Baluch. I'm happy to have her here sit with us. Tragically, because of her involvement, because she became such a famous face um, for the plight of the Iranian Baluch people and what was uh, being done to them um, in Iran for their standing up for women, life and freedom and equality. Um, her son and her brother were detained for 44 days in Iran and she was forced um, or told to be quiet. We've asked her to provide a testimony, to talk to us as if she's testifying about those horrible few first minutes that she heard that her child and her brother had been detained because of her activity. Um, I can't bear to think what that could have done to her but to her courage she stood and she said she will not be silenced and that's why she's here and that's why we will hear from her and we are happy to have her in the afternoon panel as well thank you Fariba John for being with us Fariba doesn't speak English all that well she's been working really hard to speak English for us <laughs> عرضه سلام عدد دارم خدمت همه شما دوستانی که تشریف دارید مرسی رویا جان بابت نکاتی که عرض کردید در مورد من از من خواسته شده که داستان شخصی خودم رو بگم گرشی کم سخته برام ولی چیزی که برای من اینجا خیلی مهم هستش و من همه این راه رو برای همه ما مطمئنا راحت تر کرده این مسیر رو این هستش که ما همه توی یک درد مشترک هستیم و وقتی که من میخوام داستان شخصی رو بگم به نظر من خیلی برای هیچ کدوم از ما ناآشنا نیست همچین داستانی چون هممون در واقع این مشکل رو و این درد رو و این مشکلات رو در واقع برای خانواده های ما توی ایران توی جمهوری اسلامی پیش میاره وقتی که تصمیم میگیریم پای توی این مسیح بذاریم من سعی میکنم که حالا قبلش رو اصفایی میکنم خیلی انگلیسی من خوب نیست سعی تلاش کردم که اون رو به انگلیسی بگم I'm very very humbly apologize for not being very good with her English I'm sure we will bear with her and I'm sure it's going to be amazing she's been working very hard Thank you so much. It was 11 in the evening, and I anxiously awaited my son's safe arrival home. Then a voice message from my uncle brought shocking news. My sister's careful voice revealed that they had detained my son and my brother. My world crumbled as she pleaded with me to stop mentioning or fighting parents and their desperate plea for me to remain silent. Amidst the chaos, I reflected on the pain of growing up as a woman and a Baluch minority. Despite reaching a point where I could live my own life, I couldn't ignore the suffering around me 
I chose to be voice from the children in Baluchistan, even if meant sacrifice in comfortable life. The 44 days of my son and brother's detent were agonizing. The first interrogation, interrogation and treats, and my family pleaded for me to stop, even my feminist friends. Even my feminist friend advised me to end my activism, feeling isolated and overwhelmed. I grappled with the authorized ultimatum to stay silent or risk my family well-being. The decision weighed heavily on me, on me to find pieces between by, by staying silent or to be voice for the voiceless. The image of my mother murdered children and the harsh conditions people endured flooded my mind. My mother questions why I why I choose this path. I respond, why not me? I am a mother. I am a daughter and a sister. I am a hasty Nairi mother who died at age seven of when police start shooting at the peaceful protest last year. I am a Khodanur sister who died at the peaceful protest. I am a Shemshok daughter, the female singer who is living in poverty and she's not allowing to sing anymore. And amidst all of the, this injustice, I am hopeful because I have seen the power of speaking up. I have seen how standing with, with each other that other can change the situation. I have seen the power of solidarity. I see it now here in this space. How you guys with your presence give us the Baluch community the courage to carry on in our fight. How does your support of Baluch women, of Baluchistan, sorry, how does your support of the women of Baluchistan change their life? In the end, I hold on the I, I hold on the belief that one day I will see my son again. I refuse to keep silent. For I am a mother, a woman, a baluch, dedicated to being a voice of those who cannot speak. Thank you. Thank you. I've read that piece so many times that it still shocks me to hear your sentiments. You have a tough act to follow Dr. Seema Sabet. Um, we are happy to have Seema with us. Seema Sabet is an Iran expert. I'm sure you're all familiar with her face and her voice and her activism and her standing up for the voiceless. She has been the voice of many in the last year in particular. We're happy that you're with us here, Seema John, and uh, we're waiting to hear your presentation on a strategic look to Baluchistan, and you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, well, I decided to change it slightly. Oh, well, since thank it you was for all explained us. by <laughs> other um, speakers. Um, so I just mainly focus on media. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I know that, I mean, you have been closely watching what was happening in Sisan and Baluchistan during the last year. I was one of the ones that I was um, closely following it and also was trying to um, reflect in media and the opportunity that I had in my talk show. Um, instead of going to a general explaining the circumstances, I think I would like to speak more about what can be done, what is lacking, and how we can address. Um, to me, um, I believe that the plight of Baluchis um, to a huge extent has not been reflected in media. We talk about the general issues, but we don't talk about the core of it. We don't have normally representative from that society. I'm so happy to see so many Baluchi women here. I come from that region myself. My my parents are from Sisan and Baluchistan. I must declare that I'm not 
I don't have a Sunni background and, or Baluchi background. My, my parents were from Sistan parts of Baluchi, Sistan and Baluchi, and, but they came from those kind of families that the religion didn't mean anything to them. Religious um, identity become an issue after Islamic Republic when they were emphasizing at this Shia sect of Islam as a point of dividends and gap between people. They, it was created between those people. Otherwise, I mean, before that, for generations after generations, Sunnis and Baluchis were living in the um, uh, Sunnis and Shias were living in that part of Iran without having any problem, without even knowing who is Sunni or who is Shia. Most of the parts were named um, with Sistani and Baluchi name. There were loads of similarities in those regions, but now that you can see it, there is a gap between those. It, 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 it created by inequality and discriminations for Shias, to be honest, and to start with. If you are Shia in that region, even if you're Baluchi, you would be able to have, to have a job, like government office. We had Hatam Nari who became the government governor of that, that region. By name, he was Baluchi. It had nothing to do with Baluchis and their plight. We have loads of Sistanis who they emphasize on this Shia identity in order to, 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 to create such a duality which doesn't exist amongst ordinary people. I don't want to talk about the lack of jobs or illiteracy amongst people in that region. In order to focus on their plights, we need to have to, 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 to get their voice heard. I remember the day when on 30th of September, when I was um, getting ready for the program, loads of news and videos came from Iran. I was receiving videos after videos from Iran of the massacre that was going on on the streets of Zaina, unbelievably. Uh, on, on that very day, I was desperate to find someone amongst Baluchi people to talk about it. I was desperate to find information, to get further information. I had one source who was sending me those videos and information. I needed to verify it from other sources. No one was available. Perhaps we were not ready. It's such a pity that we are hurt when we are killed. It's so sad to realize that you never spoken of until someone is dying in your region. And that's exactly what happened. And I'm so happy to hear the Baluchis' voices was on the streets of Zahedan for how many weeks? 40, 41? That's the count that I had. And I'm sorry, I, I didn't expect to become, become emotional, but I remember the day that I heard about Faribol's story and the way that her families um, were intimidated, arrested, detained in order to keep her silent. Anyone who works on this issue, who talks about the Baluchis of Iran, has experienced those, those pressures, those forces to, 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 to keep silent, to, to not to address the issue that is the most important um, talk of that region or Iran. What I heard in the slogans in Zahedan, um, it showed me that despite all illiteracy, despite all lack of experience being represented in political arena, despite all those years that they were silent, there was a pure political maturity in what they chose to write in what they chose to support, in what they chose to, 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 to chant. And I think this, this phenomenon is new. The leadership of Molavi Abdul Hamid is definitely one of the most inspiring, important part of this ongoing unrest in, in, in Zahedan. Molavi Abdul Hamid, I can't um, really say much about what he said in in the past or what he's going to do in future but definitely the way that he leads people is a clear sign that within a secular movement of women like freedom even the religious people can can find a way can find a voice 
And also it was another sign that the will from people can reflect on religious leader such Mawlavi Abdul Hamid, who once I remember that he was supporting Taliban, but this year we heard that he was supporting Baha'is of Iran. He was talking about secularism. He was talking not to force people in order to obey Islam or to do something that the Islamic Republic is asking for. I think this is significant. This is really important. But beyond that, um, what I think is it's important and it's a way forward is to, to get ready to provide further platforms to Baluchis as the least heard people of Iran. And in order to do that, we need education. We need educated ourselves in media. We need educate experts who they come from that region and they have something to say, not necessarily about the political situation of Sistan and Baluchistan. You might be economists. And you're Baluchi, but you never get the opportunity to come to, to media. You have never been invited. How we can um, somehow increase their, their, their uh, presence in media, in political arenas. We need more, more women like you. We need more men like you guys. We need everyone to come to come forward. And at the end of the day, we need practical kind of a strategy in order to make sure that five years from now, we are somewhere else. I have been in touch with Ahmad Shahid. I've been in touch with Asma Jahangir. And now um, I have a privilege of somehow knowing Mr. Javid Rahman. I interviewed him a couple of times. And I believe um, we need voices of UN reporters on human rights on our side. When I say I, on our side, it means that I, I, I consider myself one of them, one of Baluchis, one of Kurds, one of Arabs, one of all, all kind of I mean minorities inside Iran which are least heard. You have a UN platform, you have media at your door. They're, they're all, always they're asking for interviews. I think, I mean, we need to hear more about you. We, um, okay, my time is up. Okay, yes, I think I have said enough. And thank you so much. Um, no, I think that's, that's mainly what I wanted to say. And I think we need everyone in this, every person here, here is invited for one reason. And anyone with any capacity has a responsibility in order to help Baluchis to find their right representation, place, and voice in every platform. Thank you. Thank you, Sima John, for that very insightful presentation talk. Um, you've touched on so many different points and you very beautifully brought us to the next part of the conversation, which is what's been happening in Iran, specifically in the last year, but it has been happening for many, many more years. But in the last year, the world has also witnessed the massacre, the, the murders, the executions, the disproportionately high number of executions. And the question of crimes against humanity comes to mind and intentional policies of the regime to keep the region um, in poverty and in um, deprivation. I've been asked by our tech people to give a short break of about 10 minutes so they can reset everything and maybe hopefully resolve the issues that we have. So we're going to take a very short break, to only 10 minutes, please come back and then we will carry on from here about crimes against humanity and how Seema has beautifully led us to it. So thank you very much for now. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Please be back in the room in 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, 